Welcome to today's message with Pastor Dili Oshumakinde. Can we go to Genesis 17? Let me just, uh, by the grace of God, start from there and see what the Lord would, uh, uh, you know, make us to see from here. Because I started saying some things about Abraham that I just want to establish here. When Abraham was 99 years old, so you could look at your neighbor. See, at times on the faith lane, you are 99% loaded. Because you see, in the walk of faith with Abraham, God already knew Isaac would be born when Abraham was 100. So when he was 99, when it was exactly a year away, God started another relationship with Abraham. And I believe that is the case. So, so as I was looking at it, what just came to my spirit was that at this point, the breakthrough Abraham was looking for was 99% loaded. That means when you're around the corner, when the promise God has given to you is about to burst forth, this is what will happen. Don't forget I said at the beginning of the series that Abraham is Abraham 1.0, version 1.0. The believer today is version 2.0. The reason why God gave us the story of Abraham is to begin to explain to us the faith lane so that the believer today, who is a seed of Abraham, can walk by faith. So Abraham is not just one individual that lived many years ago. Abraham is a principle in God, and that's why he's the father of faith. That means at some point, what is happening to us today is that you are living out your own unique version of the story of Abraham. So that means Abraham is the expo on the faith lane. So if you want to understand where you are in the scheme of things, just look at Abraham. And that's very much what Isaiah 51 said. You, you know in Isaiah 51, he said, if you are looking for deliverance and righteousness, look at Abraham, your father. That means the Lord is saying, for anyone today who is on the faith lane, if you want to understand what God is doing with you, Abraham is the prototype. This is exactly what God did with Abraham that is doing with us today. There's no difference. So what is happening to you is that you are living out the modern version, the 2019 version of the story of Abraham. But, but you see, in principles, those things could be different. But I mean, details, I mean, they could be different, but the principle is the same. So if you look at your life, you look at your life, you will see, according to Romans 4.13, what is happening to the believer is that you are walking in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. If you look at Romans 4.13, it talks about the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. That means it doesn't ha- matter what is happening to you today. There are several steps you see that Abraham to One of those steps is this. It's either, the reason why people are struggling today and things are not matching up, is either God is asking you to come out of your father's house or you are refusing is either God is asking you to circumcise yourself or you are refusing. Is either God is asking you to take your eyes to Moriah, you are refusing. Is either there is a war you need to join, you are refusing. Is either you are meeting Mechizedek and you are refusing to tight. But if you look at your life, at every point where you miss it, it is a step of faith of our father Abraham you missed. <laughs> so that's very important. So think about it. Think about your life. So in the Abrahamic story, where am I? For some people now, where you are, and that's what we want to talk about today, is the warfare dimension of that faith. Where as Abraham, you also have to be a military person. Abraham trained 318 servants in his own house. So that means at some point on the faith lane, you need to be retrained. Your university degree is not enough. Abraham did not start out as a military man. How did he end up as a military man? And before you know it, he wasn't just a military man. He went to war and defeated five kings, Abraham, for crying out loud. That means at some point in the faith lane, God will ask you to go and take a PhD. God will ask you as a graduate to go and learn tailoring. You will do something that is different from what you were trained to do. So on the faith lane, you can't be a doctor perpetually. On the faith lane, you can't be a lawyer perpetually. There's nothing so called. On the faith lane, you can't be a banker perpetually. At some point, you need to be retrained. Somebody say, I need to be retrained. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. And if your neighbor is your husband, give him that 
go to look and say, you know what? You know what? You need to be retrained. <laughs> say, as a matter of fact, look at your neighbor. So whether it's your husband or not, now look at your neighbor. Say, you know what? Let's, let, let's, let, let's say some truth there. Come on. I mean, PD is serious this morning. I'm serious this morning. He said, what exactly are you doing? I mean, talk to that person with that kind of look. Say, what, what exactly are you doing? <laughs> Where did you come from? What did you study? Say, I studied law. And so what? Maybe God wants you to be a builder. See, that's why people ask talk. Because there are certain wealth you cannot get until you join the war. And if you're going to join the war, you need to be trained. And that is why people find it difficult to tight. You see, the first tight came out of warfare. So if you're not a fighter, you don't have resources, you will embrace the message that says tightening is Old Testament. You know, you see, look, why, 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 why do people find it difficult to tight? They don't have. If you have, does it matter if you give 10% or 20%? Is she, is she, tithing is your testament. It's because you don't have. Look, if you have, let's say every day now you are making one million, every day. <laughs> Somebody say one million every day. <laughs> but brother, if I come, I say we want to do children's church. <laughs> and we are like, we need 10 million. How is that a problem to you? Because you know, you have calculated, okay, 10 million. In 30 days, it's going to be 30 million. So what is it to give out, you know? Is it 30 is Old Testament? <laughs> Abraham is not an Old Testament principle. All throughout scripture. The faith of Abraham is held as an example of acceptable work of faith. In the Gospels, in the Epistles, in the Prophets, in Genesis, in Psalms. Every aspect of scripture Abraham is held up as the father of faith. And Jesus looked at the Pharisees and, and Israel and said, if you are indeed the seed of Abraham, you will do the works of Abraham. So we don't just say, Abraham blesses our mind, we're singing it. We do the works of Abraham. And he looked at the Sadducees and said, who, who told you to flee from the road to come? He said, don't begin to say within yourself that we have Abraham as our father. That is, that is hyper grace teaching, you know? The teaching that says, yes, I'm a seed of Abraham, but that doesn't want to do the work of Abraham. And Jesus said, don't say that you have Abraham as your father. The axe is already laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is going to be cut down. But you look at Zacchaeus, for example. They didn't met Jesus. Oh, you see, the greed and the financial issues of his life were resolved on that day. And you know what Jesus gave as a verdict? He said, he also is a son of Abraham. That means there was something Abrahamic in Zacchaeus that made him to climb the tree, that made him to know Jesus would pass that way, just like he do know what saying. When you begin to walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham, you have direction. How did he know Jesus would pass that way? And only for Jesus to get there, unknown to the guy, he was fulfilling uh, a, a spiritual injunction. He thought he was a social thing. Because, and that's one of the things we're going to look at. Because how, how do you explain a minister of finance climbing tree? If you read the 21st century version of the Bible, Zacchaeus was called the commissioner for tax. In the old King James version, he was called the chief publican. In today's analogy, we call him the commissioner for finance or, or some kind of a director in Federal Inland Revenue Service. So it's like Fowler. What's the name of that guy? Imagine you see the guy now running, running, you know? I mean, you see, when, whenever you are reading the Bible, you have to bring it into the modern day. If, if, if commissioners for tax or commissioners for finance or people in FIRS ride jeeps now. You know, when they are coming, they have their police orderlies, isn't it? Some of them use siren. They are mobile police. You could imagine Zacchaeus having his own. And yet, he wanted to see Jesus. He couldn't see Jesus. But something Abraham making him, moved him. And he said, you know what? If you stay here forever, if you don't change direction, you will never see this Jesus. That's a breakthrough so many people are looking for. You see, where you are now in life, you are, you are of a short stature. 
the kind of money you want, the kind of breakthroughs you want, your touch cannot fetch you those things. And that's why on the faith lane, you must find a psychomotor tree. And guess what? Ever before Zacchaeus was born, the tree was there. So a climb at times is a change of career. A climb at times is a change of the way you look at things. A climb at times is be more strategic, be more focused. You see, a lot of people here and here have their financial struggles, have social struggles, and the Lord is saying, can't you see the sycamore tree climb? But you see, our dignity will not want us to climb. Imagine, you see, picture that. A fowler climbing a tree. And they are like, Oga, you You are climbing. And the guy said, if I don't climb, I'm not going to see Jesus. He climbed. And read that portion. Only for Jesus to get there. But when he got to the place, it was a place. You need to get to a place before the ending of this month. You see, there's a place where the Lord will see you apart from the crowd. The problem with many of us is that we're trying to join the crowd to see him. And the Lord is saying he doesn't work like that. You have to, first of all, separate yourself from the crowd. That means at some point you need to take a decision that is not popular. But, but for the fact that you went to the University of Ibadan, you'll have been better off. See, your faith is because of your, your, your limitation of faith is because you are a graduate. Is that not an irony? If some of us were to be illiterate, you, your faith antenna will be upper. You, you will be sharper. You understand? You will be wonderful. But the fact that you are educated, you understand GS 101, so you did use of English. And that's your problem. And you forget the fact that God doesn't speak English. <laughs> God speaks spirit. An Englishman will pick it in English. And because an Englishman is trying to pick it in English, English language has a limited bandwidth. The language of God can destroy English. English cannot contain it. And that's why when they compress what God is saying into English, it's an abridged version. There is no language on earth that can sustain the momentum of the communication of God. That was why he gave us tongues. It will take the algorithm of tongues <laughs> to be able to at least have an idea of what is coming from the realm of the spirit. So you can't express it in English language. And that is why in tongues, it's like writing programming language. It's like jargons. Do you understand? If you see all that we're looking at now, if this IT guy should show you the back end, you will just see A, 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 slash, slash, B, 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 and you're like, what is all this? And they're like, it is these jargons put together that is producing software. So on the day of Pentecost, when God wanted to communicate his intention, there was no language, so it has to come in tongues. So what we are saying this morning is that when, give, give, give us that scripture again. So when Jesus got there, he said, Zacchaeus, make us come down. He said, for today. That is what that guy did not know. Imagine he did not make that shift. So there's a shift you make. I tell you as we're here this morning and as we're stepping into the week, all of us are on the agenda of God for the week, for the day. The Zacchaeus know that if you look at the itinerary of Jesus that day, Zacchaeus' name was there. Look at what Jesus said, said for today, I must. He said must. Where you were, today is your day, but you are struggling with the rest of the people. Here was Jesus saying, it is a must. I must stay at your house. But look at what happened. The greater thing, like I said. So he made this and came down and received with joyful. Move on. And he said something. Of course, people are complaining. People always complain. Leave them. If you say you want to go and learn anything now, people will complain. But look at the point I'm, I'm talking about. Now, greed died inside the guy instantly. He said, Lord... Without Jesus talking. Because this is a seed of Abraham. There's just something about us and, and money. We are not greedy. He said, half of my goods I give to the poor. So that means if I have one million, five hundred thousand is gone. And to show the depth of the debt of greed. He said, even from the remaining five hundred thousand, if I've accused anyone falsely before now, I will restore four times. 
What do you think he was telling Jesus? He said, now that I understand the faith message, I'm willing to give at all. Now I realize that true wealth is not currency. One encounter with Jesus. See where this guy landed. And there are people in church today who don't understand Genesis 17. Now give us Genesis 17 so we can get into the teaching today. Now look at this. Like I said, it's not part of the note, but I need to say this because this is important. When Abraham was 99 years old, so look at it in your own life and say, what I'm looking for is 99% loading. <laughs> Do you see that in your computer? That that thing starts. Maybe you are trying to download something and it gets 87%. It gets, because God knew at 100, something significant will happen to Abraham. And I perceive in my spirit this morning, that there are many of us seated here this morning. That is your story. You are that 99 percent, whatever. In that means it's just one. And, and, and for God, listen, that one percent is very important because that remaining one percent can mess up the 99 percent. So many of us are so close to it. We have been believing God. We have been praying. And that's why God now told Abraham. Look at what he said to him now. He said, now, the Lord had to appear and said, that is why we are taking this series. He said, I am the almighty God. That is the Hebrew word, hell shall die. Why would God introduce himself to Abraham like this? That means God is saying, when you are about to hit the breakthrough, that is where you intensify your faith work the more. That is where you stay focused. That is when you have to be persuaded and understand that there is no might elsewhere. I am the almighty God. That means there's nothing you are looking for that you can get anywhere else. You see, a time comes in our faith work, we are optionless. We hold on to God. You know, you know when we're starting out, just like Abraham, you can, you can go out and have Ishmael. But when you get to 99%, there's no room for mistake again. God is saying, you know what? I am the almighty God. So we are inaugurating a higher level of faith work now. And in this faith work, I won't allow you to even walk beside me. I will never allow you to walk behind me. You have to walk before me. That means I must come behind you. And I must be a voice behind you saying this is the way to go. And you must not go to the left or to the right unless I instruct otherwise. And look at what the Lord now says. Hey, you have to be perfect. So if I tell you wake up 5 a.m. every day to start praying, you wake up 5 a.m. every day you are praying. If I say fast two times every week, you are fasting two times every week. That means God is saying there comes a time in our faith walk there must be perfection. And how do you know you are beginning to assume that status? When, when your prayer life, your giving, and everything about you is assuming the status of perfection. That means God is instructing you, this is how much you must give, and that is how much you are giving. This, this is when you should pray, that is when you are praying. This is how long you should pray, that is how long. That means God is saying there must be a perfect work. That means there must be this level of order. And, and let's remove these playing games because a lot of people think they're on the faith lane, but they're playing games with God. And God is saying, let's forget about Ishmael now. Let's forget about all those things. Walk before me and be perfect. Be blameless. Be blameless. Be blameless. Can we all do this this week, especially in this month of May? This month is loaded. And if ever there's anything the Lord is telling us, He's saying, that's why we're taking this risk, the Almighty formula. He's the Almighty God. Walk before Him and be blameless. Look at your neighbor. Say, can we do this? Is it difficult to, to, to do? I don't think it's difficult. How many of you feel within your spirit that you are so close to it? You're about to hit it. You are like Abraham, 99%. Because by the time he was 100, pronto, before he knew it, I see it came. So God knew that 1% is, and it was in this place, God now told him to do what? For the first time, God said, there must be, oh God. You see, 
that, that was what I was praying for. That I'll be able to stay focused. But the mom looking at Genesis 17, the mom seeing things. But let me let me let me limit myself. The spirit of the prophet is over to the prophet. That means all that God was doing with Abraham before, they were like Riazals. It was for the first time that God said, and I want to make covenant between you and I. And you are wondering, what was God doing the last 24 years? And said, this is a covenant. That means, look at me. It does not matter. Look at this and listen to this. It does not matter how many instructions of faith you have carried out. There is one that is a rate determining step of faith you must carry out. It does not matter what Abraham has done. If he does not circumcise himself, the structure that is coming at this higher level, and circumcise every male born in his own house, he just wasted 24 years of faith work. And that's why we have to be, we have to obey every instruction because you don't know the one that is circumcision. So what did God say? God said this is the red determined step Cut off the hands of the flesh. Circumcise. What does it mean to circumcise? You pull back the foreskin, that is the flesh, and cut it off. That means God was telling Abraham, saying, you have gotten to a point that you are not going to have a child because you are a man. I'm going to put a seal of the covenant on you. And once that seal of the covenant is on you, you'll be able to have Isaac. If that seal of the covenant is not on you, you can only have Ishmael. Amen. Amen. So what is the thing that is a factor of production in your life that God is saying pull back and cut off the first game? Very important. And, and that was what all that God told him to do. And God said, once you do that, you have become the father of nations. Things will begin to happen. And within the next one year, read the story. God showed up again. And for the first time, God said, by this time next year, according to time of life, you have a son. For the first time in 24 years, God became specific. He was never specific with Abraham. He was always telling him, I'll give you a child, I'll give you a child, I'll give you a child. But once he did the circumcision, and if you read it in Romans, you know what Romans described in circumcision? Romans said, that is the seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had. That means it does not matter the successive steps of faith you have taken. There is one step that seals it all. And if you don't seal it and you miss the seal, it's like a wasted effort. And for some people, that very thing you are struggling with that God is saying do and you are not doing is the seal. And until it was sealed, God was never... Imagine God telling Abraham... You are going to have a child in the next one year. And one year is here, Abraham is not having a child. And I will call God a liar. So God had to wait for a time where Abraham sealed it. So when it was sealed, God knew, even if you turn it upside down, it won't pour out. Do you understand? When you seal a bottle. So the Bible says circumcision was the seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had. So there might be people here this morning who are just trying to encourage ourselves for again to the world that God is giving you an instruction. Do this. Do that. And you know you are till it, darling. Always remember Genesis 17. Maybe perhaps you are also 99% ready. And the Lord is saying, let's do this remaining 1% accurately because this is the rate determining step. Walk before me and be perfect. Let's go back to Luke 7. Now the message of today. Uh, all that we said is just to welcome all ourselves to church and to say good morning and to test the mic to be sure sound is okay, to be sure it is working perfectly, to be sure multimedia is fine, and to be sure FOJ is smiling. All right. To be sure MOJ is in church. I can't say MOJ. Hallelujah. Now let's... What we want to look at this morning is the centurion. You see, God has a way of just throwing us down. When I was teaching the centurion last Sunday on the faith lane, I thought we were true. But as I was praying this morning, the Lord began to emphasize again certain things we didn't see last week and that we should just stay again on the centurion. Now, for those who are joining us for the first time, this is part number eight. We've been looking at the faith teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And... Uh, 
And the story of the centurion is of particular importance to us because the Lord himself said, this is the highest manifestation of faith in Israel. The Lord himself said, I've not found any faith like this in Israel. So if the Lord himself testified that at that point in time in Israel, this was the highest manifestation of faith, I don't think we should rush it. That means there are powerful lessons of faith to be learned here. And um, we know the story, so I don't want to belabor the matter. Number one, what, what is the first lesson we need to learn here? The first lesson we need to learn here is this. If the law of faith is very, very similar to the law undergirding military operations, the centurion did not need to read the Bible to understand faith. He just looked at the military formation. And look at how he described military formation. I like it. Thank God that's what he put on the screen for us. He said, for I am a man under authority. So what is the similarity between faith and the military? Write it down. Number one, authority. That means the military works on the base of authority, isn't it? And so is faith. If you don't know the authority that you carry, you can't exercise faith. You can't walk by faith. So that means the first thing that was clear to the centurion is the value layer or the value chain of authority. The guy understood how authority is delegated. The guy understood how you release authority. The guy understood, number two, that authority is not released on the basis of physical presence. Authority is released verbally. So when Jesus said, I'm going to come to my house, the guy said, it's not needed. He didn't read the Bible, but it's like in the military. If my commanding officer wants me to report in Abuja tomorrow morning, he doesn't need to show up. What does he do? Thank God there's GSM now. You know you might be in church now. Let's say you're a military man. If you're a military man, there's every tendency that you will switch off your phone. Even if you say switch it off, you will not. You'll put it on vibration. Maybe you just want to respect us. So suddenly a signal is coming. Groom, groom, and you look at it. Eh? General Maru. You quickly run out. And Maru said, is that you? And you're like, yes, sir. And the man said, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, you are reporting at Jaji. What, what will you say? <laughs> no, I thought you would say you are nausea. <laughs> or you are in protocol. <laughs> what would you say? So, right now, number three, as a civilian, once you have civilian mindset, you cannot operate in faith. And unfortunately, many people in church wants to stay on the faith lane as civilians. And that is why military people don't like civilians. What, what do they call you civilians? What do we call you civilians? <laughs> no, come on. What do we call you civilians? We use one word. Block. <laughs> Say, you these what? That is they call them what? Or we call you what? Because I'm not one of you. <laughs> i point to somebody else. I said they call them. What did they call them? Funny enough, you see, a lot of us want to stay on the faith lane with a civilian mentality. It doesn't work that way. So the guy said, I'm a man under authority. Now, before, before I go far, let's break that down. Write it down. What authority are you under? A man under authority. Write it down again. If you are not under authority, you cannot exercise authority. You know why a lot of people find it difficult to walk by faith? You are on your own. You are not under any authority. You don't fear anybody. Nobody can call you to order, not even your pastor. You come to church whenever you feel like you do. You know, you know there are some people who talk to you tomorrow. Say... Hellfire will burn them on the door. If they come late next Sunday, they will still come late. That is the kind of modern Christianity which we have found ourselves. Say, 
Just like Baba Deboe said, if you are not a tight that you go to a coat and go, they will say not tight. Look, the more loose you are, once you're a loose cannon, you can't walk by faith. You have to be a, a responsible person. You have to be under authority. There must be people in your life that can call you to order. You can't just be on your own. And you are the Lord and master of your life. And that's why we tell our sisters, before you say yes to a guy, bring the guy. And what do we want to ask the guy? We don't want to ask him what state he's, he's from. That's not my business. Because every tribe is evil. And that's why in Revelation 5, Bible says he has redeemed us out of every tribe. So why do I need to plug myself into what he has redeemed us from? If every tribe is good, why did he have to redeem us out of every tribe? So I'm not interested in your state. It's not my business. I'm not interested in where you come from. But I'm interested in one thing. Who is your pastor? Who do you submit to? And it's so funny. You know, people at times think my wife and I are stupid. They don't come to church, they don't show up, they come once they, and they want to marry. And from the price church, they are bringing a letter for me to sign. And I'm like, I'm not signing. You are not a member of this church. When last were you in church? Somebody that was going in church for almost six months, suddenly you want to marry. And you show up. So that Sunday, you're not going with the girl. Ah, you now say, this is my pastor, this is my pastor. Then from the redeemed church, where they want to marry, they sent a letter and they're like, your pastor must sign. I, I, I said, you think I'm going to sign this? You are not a member of this church. You, you come to church, but you are not a member. You are not under my authority. It doesn't work that way. So sisters, before you say yes, take them to your pastors and let them ask them, who is your pastor? And by the time the guy is scratching his head, you know he cannot be a good husband. You know why? He's not responsible to anybody. So he will slap you, he will beat you, he will do, and he will, he will abuse you because you don't have any authority over you too. There, see, there are some people in my life today, if you say you want to report me, I know I'm in trouble, and you know who, who is number one on the list. But there are some guys that are not like that. So that's why you marry them, you can't walk by faith again. Because that relationship is not synonymous with what this guy is saying. He said, I have soldiers under me. Look, write it down again. On the faith lane, as a believer, what soldiers do you have under you that you talk to? That's how faith works. You have to understand where you are in the value layer of authority in ranking. You have to understand who is above you. You have to understand who is below you. Once you have that understanding, for example, as a believer, you need to know money is below you. Once you pull money above you, you can't walk by faith. You can't walk by faith. Do we understand? So it is very, very important we have an understanding of what we're talking about here. Hallelujah. I said to this one, do what? Go. And he does what? He goes. I said to another one, come. And he does what? And I said to my servant, do this. And he does what? Look at that last statement. That's where I want to begin from. I said to my what? Who was he begging Jesus to come and heal? His servant. So what kind of servant was this servant to him? Did you see? It is the kind of servant that you say, do this, and it does what? You see why he was asking Jesus to come and heal this guy? Because if you look at it again, back of a little, you see, let's establish that, so that you know that he was talking about this particular servant. Verse number two. And we can get into the message proper. Verse number two. No, I'm, I'm reading from Luke 7. You are in Matthew 8. Please, Luke 7. Luke 7, verse number two. Look at it. And a centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So there's a particular servant. 
And when he heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, pleading him that he should come into his house. And this is a beautiful thing, like he said, about reading the synopsis of the gospel. Instead of just reading in Matthew, read it in Luke. In Matthew, if you read it in Matthew alone, what you will have read will be, it came to Jesus himself. That was how Matthew portrayed it. And that Jesus now said, um, I'm going to your house and eventually, but, but thank God for Luke. Luke made us understand that he, he could not even come to Jesus. He had to send the elders of the Jews. Now, as a military person, now this is the message for today. This guy had privileges. You can imagine he was a Roman general. He was a centurion. That means he had 100 soldiers under him. As a commander, all dressed soldiers were waiting on him. At his beck and call, he had hundred of them. But what did he use his privileges to achieve? You see, in life, we are, see, the difference between the traditional faith teachings and the faith teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ is kingdom. Unlike what is traditionally taught in faith, the Lord Jesus was the only person that linked faith with kingdom mindset. You see the problem why a lot of people don't get results is really on the faith link where people are frustrated. Over time, we, we think faith is all about take scripture, confess, 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 continue to confess, continue to confess. But the Lord is beginning to show us that beyond confession, there are other things. So what is the vital lesson from the centurion? What do you use your privileged status in life to do for others? Because this guy had 100 servants. So how can one be sick and you are begging Jesus? I mean, he could as well die. So that means the first lesson here on the faith lane is that how do you treat those under you? How do you treat your servants? Especially when you have so many of them. And you can even have four. I mean, when you have 100, even if 10 should die, and so what? You know, from, from, the, from the part where I, I come from in Abelkuta, Part of our, what they call a Ricky in English. Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> is, they'll say, or oh, more this, or more that. So one of the things they say that is, is the son of, if, if a slave should die, you buy another one. That's what don't get. So this guy too, privileged guy. What does it take for a servant to die? Why do you need to involve Jesus. That means on the faith lane, listen, and don't forget that's where we started from. How do you treat your drivers? House helps, gardeners, gate men. You see, for many of us, these people are not important. That is why you are where you are. You, you see, you maltreat these people. Some of us are here, the way we treat house helps. God help you. But not the centurion. So on the faith lane, people are important. As well as those that are very low there, very low in the food chain, very low that you can afford to just kick away. I mean, imagine a believer now. Let's say you come out and your gate man doesn't greet you. What does this stop you as a believer to greet him first? What do you lose? If I, instead of you greeting him for you, like, have you seen me this morning? Okay, have you seen him this morning too? What, what is wrong? He's saying good money. Because you know, you know the, your pride is too low. So you must be the one I must greet you. You slam the door, then you call them, your secretaries, you come to office, and everybody's afraid because the lion has gone. How do you pay attention to their needs? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How did Jesus explain this situation? Go back to Matthew 8. So, see, these are the little, little things. And that's why you are praying. You are confessing. Nothing is happening. Because you have forgotten the kingdom pathway of faith. So, what Jesus came to establish is the faith kingdom combo. That you can't walk by faith without having kingdom mindset. That what drives the operating system of faith, as far as the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned, is 
is the kingdom mindset. And that is why you see the faith teachings of Jesus that they are somehow different from the traditional faith teachings we've been hearing over time. If you see everywhere Jesus taught faith, he emphasized kingdom. How did he, how did he say this one? Now, look, when he was explaining that many will come from the east and from the west. Now, give it to me. So after the centurion said all that he said, now explain to us the back end. See, that's the beautiful thing about the Lord. He quickly explained to us the back end. Now, what do you think is happening here? What made this centurion to speak the way he spoke? Jesus gave us the story. He said, I said to you, after the centurion dazed him, Jesus now said, let me tell you what happened there in the realm of the spirit. So I'm saying to you that many will come from the east and from the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But what will happen as a consequence of that? Please, the next verse now. But the source of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that means the Lord is saying, what happened to this centurion was, he first of all dropped his eastern mindset and his western mindset and he sat with Abraham. That means why is it that people are not making progress? You are still thinking like an easterner. What does it mean to come from the east? Eastern wisdom is a kind of wisdom that says your servant cannot sit where you are sitting. You know what I'm saying? You see, the, the Eastern wisdom is Buddha, Confucius, everything from China, you know? Or maybe from Eastern Nigeria too. So what did Centurion do? He first of all dropped his Eastern mindset. Western mindset is because some of us went to school. That means both East and West as cardinal points are anti faith. So Jesus explained that what is going on here is that this guy is, is fulfilling a law of faith. Number one, they are jettisoning their Eastern mindset. That means they are like the wisdom of the East, we are not going to operate in it. The wisdom of the West, we are not going to operate in it. We are not going to see. What is the wisdom of the West? Many of us just say nuclear family, nuclear family. Since you have been working, since you have been doing things, nobody has lived with you. Nobody has lived in your house. People have not made your city room dirty. They've not thrown away your throw pillows. Because your Western wisdom says our city room must be sparkling clean. I'm not saying your city room should not be clean. Your Western wisdom will not allow people to even sit and be comfortable. As you are receiving guests, you are looking at where they sit, how they sit, they should not make the chair dirty. Have you seen people? They, they almost will tell you not to lean your back. You know? And you're like, for crying out loud, are we in prison now because we came to visit you? My, ah, that's not how I do my kitchen. People are using your kitchen. You are not comfortable. You are like, <laughs> you are standing at the door. You are pacing the floor. Because you want them to know that my kitchen, my kitchen, my kitchen, kitchen. Western wisdom. That means if centurion were to think like a Roman, give it, give it to us in Luke 7 again. Why were the elders of the Jews willing? Give, give me Luke 7. See what he did. To know that he jettisoned for, for the centurion, he was a Westerner because he was a Roman. Nobility. Have you seen Paul? They wanted to beat Paul. The moment Paul said, I'm a Roman. What happened? They dropped the game and they started apologizing. And the guy who wanted to beat Paul said, I bought this citizenship with money. Paul said, I'm free born. Huh? The guy said, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> Imagine they wanted to beat you. They've already put what they got, that thing in your head. The guy banned Paul. And my he was afraid. Quickly, when Paul said, he raised the king and Paul said, I'm a Roman citizen. Eh? The guy said, I'm sorry, sir. He had to quickly, and he was like, how did you get this citizenship? Paul said, I was free born. That was, I was, the guy said, I obtained it with money. Look, why would they want to fight for this guy? The leaders of the Jews said, 
this guy, Jesus would must do something. They were pleading with Jesus. And, and like, what was the basis? Verse number five. They said he was deserving. What did he do? Oh, uh, look, you cannot walk by faith outside of a genuine love walk. He loved our nation. How can a Roman love the nation? You see, to a, to a Roman, Jews are inferior. At this point in time, the Romans were colonizing the Jews. So Jews were nobodies. Why must you love Jews as a Roman? Why must you love your house help? They don't deserve your love now, do they? Some of us have house help drivers. We don't love them because they are half, you are a Roman, they are Jews. But by, by, by every stretch of imagination, you are nobility. As a Roman, oh my God. You see, I, what, what can we describe? I, I mean, saying an American is even too small. Maybe if you say you're American, British, Russian, Chinese, and what? And Canadian at the same time. Imagine you have the system of all those. Uh, but you see, you, you can't even quite. It's not fitting, really, because it's deeper than that. Imagine people, I mean, if a Roman citizen is coming this way, Jews will be running away. Which was why they hated tax collectors. You know, you know why they hated tax collectors? Tax collectors would collect money from Jews and go and give it to Romans. So that's why every, the, the, the worst of sinners in the Jewish society were tax collectors. Because they were helping the Roman government. And, and Roman government crucified Jesus. Roman government started crucifixion. Roman, Romans were, you see, they, they, I mean, it, it's just like when the British were, imagine in Nigeria of um, 19, let's say a little after amalgamation of 914, let's say in Nigeria of 920. Do you know at that time, no Nigerian, no Nigerian could look up to a British. Imagine you now say Nigeria slapping a British person. You are dead. Because not only were they colonial masters, they were in charge of everything. So that, that was the kind of society. So what happened to this guy that suddenly, in a privileged position, he just looked at these Jews and he loved them. And the elders testified. They said, look, this guy loves our nation. Your house help, your drivers, people around you, people who are inferior, do they say this about you? That our God loves us. And Jesus is saying this is the real McCoy when it comes to faith. Why? Why? Now let's look at it. Why does he need to love them? Why? When his country were oppressed, I mean, this, I you see, the Jews were nobodies to the Romans. No, I mean, it's just Jews. Well, we are Jews. Oppressed them, colonized them, took away, I mean, Pontius Pilate became their leader, took away their poly, I mean, imposed their own people. Pontius Pilate imposed Herod. I had one guy that was posted there as a military person, privileged, had 100 people under him. Not only did he care about his servant at home, even the Jews around him that his own nation were oppressing, he loved them. Let her be love shared amongst us. Let her be love in our hearts. May now your love fill this nation. Cause us, O oh Lord, to arise. Give us a fresh understanding of brotherly love. That is real. I mean, you, you, you see how some believers to the house there, and you want to cry. You don't care about their education, you don't care about their dignity. All of you will be eating jollof rice and chicken is the uh, bar of two weeks ago. You give them to eat. The guy won't eat near you. They have to eat outside. Why? Why? What is all that now? That there are no humans or what? And that is why, that's why Jesus is not commending our faith. That's why Jesus is saying, look, well, it, it was not just don't come to my house that Jesus was commenting. That's why we're looking at the back end. Jesus is saying, this guy, this is the greatest manifestation of faith in Israel.
I'm not saying we should now not allow them to do their work, like those who work for us, but why we are trying to get them to do what they do, do we show them love? Do you buy things for your children and also buy for your house helps? Do you celebrate their birthdays? Or they don't deserve to, their own birthdays, they were born outside of the calendar. So it's not supposed to be celebrated. Hallelujah. Look at the second thing he did. He built us a synagogue. For crying out loud. Why? That's what I don't understand. Why? A Roman. You love them and you took your own money. A Roman. To build the Jews a synagogue. Do you know what it means? Do, do you know what a synagogue is? Come on, do you know what a synagogue is? Maybe the one synagogue is confusing us. He built, he built a church. He built a chapel. A Roman. So in life, what do you use your privileged status to do? There is nobody in this room that is not privileged. If you are not privileged, you won't be here. Someone will say, ah, Pastor D, are you talking about me? Me, that I can't even pay my rent. You are privileged. That's why you are here. The fact that you can hear me, you can speak English, you went to school, you are already privileged. How, 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 I mean, you see, I don't understand. And, and, and you see, the one that baffled me was that Ma and Sars, he did all this and he still did not feel worthy to come and meet Jesus himself. He had to send the elders. He said, he said, I have not, have not done enough. I have not done enough to meet that man. What kind of reverential fear? You know, he could have, that means the guy did not have entitlement mentality. You love the nation, you build in God. In fact, you say, call Jesus for me. Tell him to come. That's the attitude also. He said, Jesus, it's in our God. Tell him, saying, I'm in building in God. You know, he, he, he would have said, Jesus, come, come, come. Are you Jesus? Come. <laughs> Write it down. Arrogant people can never walk by faith. On the faith lane, pride will knock you off that lane. This guy did so much for Jesus. I mean, for, for the Jews, for the synagogue. And when it was time to see Jesus, he said, Help us, please help me to go. And Jesus said, Okay, I'm coming. He said, ah, I am not worthy that this guy should come under my roof. Can you imagine? Despite all this, he still felt I'm not worthy. And I said, tell him to speak. So authority. Let's learn 10 things from the military. I will close. I told Multimedia to prepare that for me. Do we have it? Ten things we need to learn about the military that will help to boost our faith. So I've emphasized the importance of authority. Authority. And that's why when Jesus was going, what did he leave with us? He said, all authority. So, so that means Jesus is saying there's no reason why you can't walk by faith. Because the basis of authority. Number one, did you see that? Appreciate your friends. It's a law of faith. Have you seen Jesus every time he taught faith? He taught it also within the context of appreciating relationships. You might call them servants. You might call them drivers, ourselves, and whatever. Many of us will be immobile, if not for them. Many of us cannot do anything ourselves other than these people. And yet, we victimize them. We don't appreciate them. We don't do things for them. And, and all we are doing is confessing scripture like parrot. And we say we are unfaithful. That's why Jesus taught the practical side of faith. So it's not just, and the righteousness of God in Christ. And the righteousness of God in Christ. And, righteous, and yet the house help is eating. And you know that that soup is sour already. You know. Then gave it to her. And your own children are eating chicken. And like, mommy, this chicken is sweet. And your conscience is not bothering you. That, what's going on here? How many of us do that? 
Let's, let's help you this morning. Come out. <laughs> I know you won't come out. You see, those are kingdom dimensions. Those are opportunities to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob passing you by. So the centurion sees the opportunity, sat with him. That means Abraham reprogrammed him. Abraham must have told him. That's what Jesus is teaching there. And don't forget, one way or the other, you will meet Abraham. Just as some people will meet him very late. Hugs the rich man. Rich man died. He was buried. Lazarus died. Where did Lazarus find himself? Abraham's bosom. So whether in now or in future, Abraham is still part of your story. Because even in, in the afterlife, Abraham is still chairman. But the rich man met Abraham too late. But the funny thing is that once you sit with Abraham, you are reprogrammed. That rich man, all throughout his life, never cared for his brothers. But the moment he met Abraham, he said, Father Abraham, I have five brothers. While he was alive, he could not care. Because there's something about having this Abrahamic mindset that will make you to care for people. He said, I have five brothers. I don't want them to come back. Do you know he changed? Did you see that the rich man changed? What was the change factor? He met Abraham. You know, he could have said, I am here. Let them also come there. <laughs> so after all, the more the merrier. Let all of us go. But you see, he changed. He said, I don't want them to come here. He said, I am here already. Fine. But I don't want my brothers to come here. He said, send somebody to go and warn them. And Abraham said, that is not how he walks. He said, the way he walks is this. If they don't listen to the Moses and prophet, that means if they don't listen to PDP more and the people who stand here, they will not still be persuaded even if one should rise from the dead. So Abraham said the way he walks in the kingdom is the integrity of God's word. That there is no supernatural manifestation that is greater than the integrity of the word. That God does not use manifestation to validate his word. It's the other way around. But you know the problem with the centurion or like with the rich man or like the centurion? The centurion sat with Abraham in life. The rich man sat with Abraham after life. It was too late. So anyhow, in life or after life, you have something to do with Abraham. So Abraham reprogrammed this centurion. Number one, that you are a Roman, but you must walk in love. You must not have any toga of arrogance. You must embrace people. You must love people. You must appreciate your friend. You must appreciate those who carry your file, those who do things for you, they matter. They might not have a name. They might come from, 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 from Kogi State or from anywhere. It doesn't matter. They might be Takbas or Igbira or any of those things. It doesn't matter. You are not a superior race. You are not Nazis. You are not doing that Roman Jew thing. And any privilege God has extended to you as a Roman, extend to the Jews. That's what Paul's gospel to the epistle to the Romans is all about. He said, first to the Jews and also to the Greeks. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That's how it is. Number two, lessons we need to learn. You always have something more to give. That's the truth. The other day we told people to bring close to church. That was when we were in Abuja to go and give to less privileged. And people were bringing rags. And I'm like, what do you think you are doing? I said, bring clothes that I want to give to less privileged. You are bringing clothes that you have used. So if I come to your house and I give you clothes that I want, will you take it? I said, remove everything. Next one day, go and buy new clothes and bring it. Why do we give less when we can give more? I have 100 servants. One of them is sick. Why do I need to invite Jesus? How is that my problem? Do you know if that guy should die, they will send another soldier to him. He doesn't, I mean, this is Roman government now. It's not. But it shows how, how, how he loved one servant so dearly. You can give more. You can do more. Move on. What's the last thing we need to learn? You can't always rely on technology. Is that not funny? 
Is that not funny? Because technology can fail you at times. Don't allow WhatsApp, Facebook, and all those things to change the way we interact with people. Technology cannot replace visits. There was a time we did very well without phones, didn't we? So what happened to us? That now you send WhatsApp message and you think that is love. I'm just checking on you. You are not checking on the person. If you send me WhatsApp message, you have not checked on me. Because WhatsApp doesn't tell me how I am. I, at times, if you don't sit with me, you can't know. You say, what's up? Even, even video call cannot give you. Technology should never replace love and friendship in our generation. You don't check. You see, Pastor Morris' mother's mom, mom died. And he said, accept our condolences. How do we accept your condolences? Via WhatsApp. But if you come to the house and you sit with Pastor Morris, you will know she was... Oh, uh, God just helped her. That's why she's here. I'm not saying come and visit. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying how we have, you know, move on, please, because of time. Number four, there are worse things than being bored, it's part of the military life. Can you stay focused? Look at that guy. He's on that hill. He can be there for 30 days without seeing a single enemy. Without seeing a single enemy. But he will stay there. That's one of the U.S. Marine guys. On one of the hills in Afghanistan. He's just there as a sniper. Looking for anything. And he's there. That's how faith works. He's there. This guy is not going to leave there and say, I'm bored, I'm going. After I've been there for five hours, I've not seen any enemy. That is the attitude of many of us when it comes to the faith things we're doing. Once, once there is boredom, you give up. You're like, oh, we've been giving. We've been confessing. You see, stay there. There's a time, the only thing you need to do on the faith lane is to stay there. Move on. Learn from the experiences of others. Learn from the centurion. It's as if there's something about these centurions, don't we think? If you remember Cornelius also. Cornelius was like this guy too. Another Roman guy. In fact, he was, he was in charge of an Italian regiment. That's how the Bible put it. But the Bible says he was always praying to God. And he was always giving alms. That angel had to appear to Peter. He said, your you have to appear to call you and say, your prayers and your hands given has come up as a memorial before God. So automatically we must get you saved. Send to Peter to come and pray to you. That means if angels could have gotten you saved, we would have gotten you saved now. But just like the wisdom of God, only man can get man saved. Can you imagine an angel had to appear the same thing Cornelius? So, so that means... What all these guys are telling us is that if you don't have the mindset of a military man, you can't walk by faith. The faith lane is a militarized zone. You can't, you can't be thinking a civilian. You see, in the military, there's, there's what is called commitment. Look at those guys. He's, he's learning how to shoot. That guy is instructing him. He doesn't say, I'm tired. Give me a book. Give me a bar. I'm, you see, Commitment to be trained, to be retrained. What happened to the centurion? He learned from the experience of Abraham. Jesus said, this guy came from the east and from the west and sat with Abraham, sat with Isaac, sat with Jacob. So Abraham must have told him, you see, on the faith lane, you walk by love. Isaac must have told him, you can't afford to cheat anybody. Jacob must have told him, on the faith lane, God will break your tie. So you can rely on him. Move on. Number six, confidence is king, be decisive. Look at that guy, what is he holding? That's an assault rifle. Ask your neighbor, what is it that you are holding that will make the enemy to know you have authority? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 
You see, the enemy does your... <laughs> Let me explain it this way. As we close. What is the difference between authority and power? The enemy has power, but he doesn't have authority. Even Jesus, when he was commissioning Paul, acknowledged the fact that the enemy has power. You know what he said to Paul? If you look at the commissioning of Paul, he just said, I'm going to deliver you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to deliver them from the power of Satan. Those were the words of Jesus. But when Jesus was going to leave here, before he left, before he went to the cross, at some point he looked at his disciples and said, I've given you authority to tread upon snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers. Did you see? He said, I'm giving you authority to overcome the power of the enemy. So that means Jesus distinguished that what the enemy has is power. What I have is authority. Then, after he rose from the dead, he changed the narrative. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. So on the basis of that, go ye therefore and teach. So, what's the with authority and power? Satan is powerful, but he does not have authority. And this is the frustration of the enemy. You have a power you are not authorized to use. Let me use U.S. to describe it. Within America, and outside of America, they have what they call military bases, where they have all their atomic weapons everywhere. Whenever the U.S. president is traveling, somebody will hold a briefcase. You know what they call that briefcase? Football what? They call it football field. Somebody will hold it. Do you know what is inside that briefcase? The settings for the entire nuclear power of America. That means anywhere U.S. president is, he can launch a nuclear attack against any nation without leaving at the spot. Where those nuclear powers are all over America, there are people manning those places. They have power. But they don't have authority to lift a finger. The only person who has authority is the U.S. president. He does not need to be physically present there. Just by saying, launch. Every power must respond because he has authority. So when Jesus said, all authority, that means the Lord is saying, anywhere there's power of Satan, it's because a believer is not exercising authority. Because authority is greater than power. Authority will determine when power can be used, how it's going to be used, and where it's going to be used. The other day, President Buhari traveled. You know what he carried with him? Authority. He didn't carry any rifle out of Nigeria. Even when the president is moving. Have you seen the cover of the president before? You know, a lot of people think when the president is moving, all the soldiers in Nigeria will be there. At most, maybe 25, 30 personnel will be in his convoy. The president himself does not carry a single gun. But you see all the people around him carrying gun. As well as when they are doing what they call that thing they do, when he's marching, guard of honor. They are all with gun. And the president is just moving. He's not carrying anything. You know why? When you have authority, you don't need to carry anything like that. Authority often is not seen, but it's real. And that was what the centurion was telling Jesus. He said, Jesus, you are the only one with authority here. You don't need to come physically. Just speak. Because authority is executed verbally. Based on the understanding that you have. So, so it is important for you to know what you have. You see, for this soldier, it's a physical thing. But for us, he said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they are not physical. They are not something that we have to, but they are mighty through God to pull down strongholds. Move on, please. Let's close because of time. Value your sleep. Is that an instruction of faith? You know why he said value your sleep? So just don't sleep. 
In the U.S. Army, you sleep an average of four hours every day. You know why people don't walk by faith? You are, you are snoring too much. Have you seen how many of us are religious when it comes to sleep? They say, I want to sleep. I want, are you alive? For crying out loud. Wake up and pray. You wake up and pray. Nobody say you should not sleep. These guys do four hours every day. And I'm persuaded anybody that is doing more than six, seven hours every day, you are lazy. Why are you sleeping? And saliva is coming out and you don't wake up at night to pray. And when they wake you up, you are hungry. I don't like people disturbing my sleep. My sleep. My sleep. Let me tell you one fact of life. If you are still sleeping the way you used to sleep, it's very right likely you are not going anywhere. Sleeplessness is part of faith work. At times you can't just sleep. There are things to do. There are prayers to pray. There are, there are confessions to make. I'm not saying don't sleep. And that's why I say value your sleep. That means five hours, do the five hours, wake up and start doing things. Move on. You can't do everything on your own. That's why the centurion loved his servant. Because he valued relationship. Move on. You are what you eat and drink, isn't it? You know, soldiers pay special attention to what they eat and drink. They don't just, they are not like Nigerian army. And they give them one bowl of eba and, and small soup and they put water. How many of you saw that? You know, the closest experience many of us had, as far as military is concerned, was NYC. So I got to a rotation camp in Calabar where I served. It was at Obubra, that's the name of the city. And the first day, the first evening, I went to the clinic. Then the clinic is beside the kitchen. I just wanted to know where the clinic was. I just going around to. I just saw where they were preparing our food. So they were preparing stew. After they finished preparing it, they now took a two buckets of water and poured inside. Poured another one. Ah, uh, really? I saw it. I said, "Till I leave this camp, I will never eat NYC's food." And I did not. I did not eat it once. Once it's break time, I go and buy my own food at Mami Market. Because I'm like, is this what, I mean, they were pouring water and they were not warming it again. I said, eh. listen, why is this important? You don't pray to grow, you eat to grow. Did you hear me? You don't pray to grow. You see, what you feed on is what will determine the kind of soldier that you are. The centurion fed on Abraham, sat with Abraham. See, on that table, there's something they eat there. It's called the word of faith. Many of us don't listen to messages, don't listen to teachers. Once we come out of church, I mean, oh my God, thank God for those days in university. Till now, you take tapes, you listen, you listen. Conferences are going on, you listen. You, but, but many of us is, is Brother Shaggy. You see, those are just distractions. With due respect to those guys, you know the latest episode of what's the name of that small girl? You see, you know, you know, you, you know, you know. If I ask you who is Epaphroditus, you don't know. Epaphras, you don't know. Phoebe, our sister, you don't know. Alexander the Copper Smith, you don't know. Emmanuel and Philetus. Emmanuel and Alexander. Apollos. He said, is he the one that affects people's eyes? <laughs> but, but if you say, Wole Arole, Wole Agba, Bada Shaggy. What's it? What are their names again? Which one? Eh? Don't pretend now. Now, just... <laughs> Those are your favorites. And that's why you are buying airtime. Imagine many of us buy airtime not to listen to PD. Not to listen to anything serious. You buy airtime because of Woli Agba. And daily and... Oh, God. When the son of man shall come, will he find faith on the earth? Yes, Lord, you'll find it. Because many of us will stay on that faith name. Those guys are, are more popular. They are more real to you. 
for you are watching out for the next episode. If I ask you, when last did you listen to Kit Moore? You remember, careful, do I say, hey, kid, you say, who is that? Is that the name of a demon? You know, you know. <laughs> things that pertain to us, we don't want any of those things. We are listening to people making mockery of those things. Like I said, with due respect to those guys, I don't fault them. It's the state of the church. If the church were to be sound, you wouldn't even be listening to any of those guys. Because they are making mockery of all that we are doing here. And people are laughing. And people are enjoying it. With due respect to them, oh, they are smart guys. They are just making money. Because of the way we are. Let them try some of those things in Islam. That is the last time they will do it. Because they will stone them to death. But you know, in Christianity, anything goes. Especially with the state of the church in Nigeria. So you are what you eat. Imagine your spirit. What is there is daddy shaggy. Or brown shaggy. You are what you eat. As you are watching those things, you are feeding. So that you don't know, you are feeding. And getting into those mindsets are beginning to affect you. You are beginning to think like them. I mean, we were at the barrier. Are you going to hear be bought there for Jesus? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. What has Jesus got to do with be bought there? What is be bought there? <laughs> that is what you are eating. <laughs> You are eating paper deer. That's a, and that's why that's what paper deer. What, what kind of slang is that? Paper deer. It's not paper deer for Jesus. Paper deer for the Lord. Please don't come and do that there. <laughs> we are not doing paper deer for Jesus. And have you noticed in church today, we dance like what we see on social media now. What's the name of all those dance people too? <laughs> and, and, <laughs> And they are like, <laughs> and look, <laughs> in as much as I, I cannot condemn dance, dance is dance. More believers are beginning to teach us, Because we are, we, we've eaten so much of that in Shaggy. Or brother Shaggy. Ole Agba. Ole Arole. Ashiri. Who again? Emanuela. When I go to start eating again, Kit Moore, Kit Butler. Craft of Dollar. Or a robot. They are all available on YouTube. Lester Sombra. Daily Oshimagine. Pojo Yemade, and so on and so forth. When are you going to start doing that? And stop. Not just be but <laughs> Let's not say we want to do that. We need you to lift your spirit. Uh, no body. Your body is the flesh. Man, don't be body. Be spirit. I wish the way your body is active, your spirit is alive. Finally. So you are what you eat and drink. So stop eating. Appearance matters. How do you appear? I'm not talking about physical dressing, spiritual dressing. Now you remember that parable. That's kingdom mindset. He said, "Go to the edges and highway, bring everybody. Anybody, bring them in." And the master said, and he looked at one guest. He said, "Why are you not dressed?" And you'll be like. Why is he inflicting so much punishment? He said, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. You invited him for wedding, but he was not dressed. And I thought it was the meaning of dressing. Look at the army. The beautiful thing about the army is uniformity. If you say service is nine, why can't everybody be there for nine? That is what you never find. Imagine as they were doing this mad pass, somebody's now coming, bringing his own gun and saying, Emma Bino is a traffic. <laughs> As someone say, my neighbor blocked me. As someone say, my wife is pregnant. 
Look, it's a team war. You want to do 21 gun salute? You are not coming. <laughs> In fact, you are not dressed. You are just wearing your trousers. They will shoot you. <laughs> because they will think you are an enemy. But look at all of them. Look at the beauty of unity. Everybody standing together. I have not seen any church in Nigeria. Whereby they say service is nine. And by nine everybody is seated. Why can't we do that? Why is it difficult for us to understand that this is a military zone? Why do we act like civilians? You see some people, it is 10, they'll be coming. And they're coming comfortably. You see that they have pocket. I mean, like, eh, 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 man, too, but why? You know, I mean, I mean, that's the mindset. I mean, why, why can't even thank God we came? But look at that. Can you, can you, can you recognize any of them? They are all together, dressed the same way, ready to imagine somebody is not coming and say, eh, "Well, I woke up this morning, my tire, I had flat tire." What's the meaning of that? And that's why Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one that wore it and targets himself with the affairs of this life and may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. One of the greatest manifestations of Christianity is this military mindset and which is kingdom mindset. I'd like you to rise up this morning. For more online messages, check us out at www soundcloud.com forward slash tbc mainland